Welcome back to the show. Eric Lieberman is with us. And Eric, welcome to the program. Thank and you so much. It's good to see you. And it's great thank to you see for you. taking the time to come to talk to us. It's a pleasure. I've never been to your neck of the woods before. I've never been to this part of the country, and I love it. Very accommodating folks, right? Absolutely. So warm, so friendly, and very, very welcoming. Okay, so what brings you to our area? I know you're working on the book, right? Yes. Well, it's most unusual. You know, there was an actress named Jane Mansfield in the 1950s and 60s. She's quite well known to many generations, but to this generation, she's really not known. But if you know who Kim Kardashian is, if you know who Lady Gaga, Madonna, even Martha Stewart is, they're all standing on the shoulders of some that Jane Mansfield pioneered, well beyond being a movie star and a television personality. She was a brilliant businesswoman, and sadly she, she lost her life along with Ronnie Harrison and, and her companion Sam Brody, driving between Biloxi and New Orleans to make a talk show appearance. So I'm, I've been interviewing people in the area to really give human voice to that last week of her life. What year was that? That, that was 67, June okay. 29th. You see, as a, a young boy, growing up in the New Orleans area. Yeah. Uh, you know, I remember that so vividly yeah. because I guess I was just coming to, into uh, a point as a young boy. Yes. Where I, I was very aware of Jane Mansfield. She was exciting. She was exciting. She was blonde. She was shapely. She was sensational. So it was a sensational thing when that happened. Yeah. And it happened down here. Yeah. It happened in our neck of the woods. Well, there was a lot of mythology surrounding her car accident, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she did not die in the way that people thought. That was a creation of the press and it was a creation of the press that she enabled while she lived because she really was the first movie star who said I want the public to know who I am behind closed doors in essence she uh, she invented the reality star phenomenon she she piloted three reality shows and if if Twitter and Instagram were around at that time she would have been the queen of them so What's the connection, uh, we were talking before we went on the air, between uh, her career and uh, how how did she uh, did she model uh, Marilyn Monroe? Did she? Was yes, she, uh, yes. So, in the 1950s, um, it was a very different time for women. You know, as it is than it is now. And Marilyn Monroe was the world's top box office attraction. And Marilyn said, "You know, I don't want to play a dumb blonde anymore. I have thoughts. I have feelings about things, just like you do." So she uh, sat on strike against 20th Century Fox, who was her movie studio. She went to New York to study at the Actors Studio. She married playwright Arthur Miller and developed her mind. And the studios all said, "Well." Forget you, lady. We'll just replace you with somebody who looks like you. So they groomed Jane Mansfield, Diana Doors, Mamie Van Doren, a whole bevy of other actresses and said, they can be blonde and big chested and have a beauty mark too, and, and they'll sell just as many tickets. Well, they couldn't, because Monroe had a kind of mystique. But Fox gave it their fighting all by bringing Jane Mansfield, who was a Broadway star at the time, out west, and saying, give Monroe a run for her money. So Mansfield was curvier, she acted dumber, and she captured the public imagination. But then Monroe came back. Monroe came back to Fox under the auspices of her own production company and said, all right, I'm gonna make the films I want on my terms and you're gonna distribute them. And so she threw a massive gauntlet down in the fight for women's rights. And Mansfield was sent out to pasture. So she had to grow super inventive around how she was going to cultivate and maintain her audiences and support the five children that she had. So she became an expert saleswoman. She mastered something called necessity entrepreneurship, which is when you dissolve the barrier between audiences and stars in her case. And she became famous for being famous. She endorsed products. She cut supermarket ribbons at openings for $10,000 a pop. She headlined in Vegas. She was the highest paid Vegas headliner at $35,000 a week, which was about a quarter of a million dollars back in the late 1950s. She made her home a destination that tourists could come and visit if they wanted to see a real life movie star. And she played club dates at places like Gus Stevens Supper Club here on the Gulf Coast. And that's what brought her here in 1963, which was her first appearance, and then in 1967, which was her very last. But she was the people's princess, like Diana. And by granting uh, a near Pavlovian 
access to the press corps. When she rang, they showed up. Uh, sadly, they surrounded the site of her car crash and exploited it like they did with Princess Diana decades later. And um, she really allowed the public to feel that they had carte blanche, which was a blessing and a curse while she lived. She was so ahead of her time. So ahead and constantly reinventing herself. When you look at Madonna or Gaga, uh, you know, one day there's a meat dress, the other day she's got a different color hair. That's also a technique in business called dishabituation, which is never let the consumer get too acclimated to what you're offering. You have to keep surprising them because then they'll come in droves to see what it is you're presenting today. And she did that. One day she had a brown wig. The other day she was wearing go-go boots. You know, then she was a throwback to the 1950s sex kit. And you have to understand also that women's sexuality in the 50s and the 60s were completely different. The 50s were look but don't touch. I, I am sexually attractive, but I know nothing about that. Women were either mothers or sexy, but never both. Jane bridged that gap. Now, when Marilyn Monroe died and President Kennedy was assassinated, there was an innocence that was destroyed in this country. And the advent of female contraception allowed women to make choices about when and with whom they related. Uh, so Mansfield had to bridge two very disparate worlds of a woman who says, stay away but look, and another one who says, I own who I am, I own my sexual identity. Uh, so she was quite a pioneer. She had a lot on her plate to deal with in terms of the changing cultures of the era. Okay, so you were working on the book. And, yes. And that brought you here. Yes. You're doing research. Yes. So tell us about um, what uh, some of the research. Yeah. So what have you uncovered here? And well, you found some good, it's, some interesting yeah, things. It's exceptional. It's exceptional because there are still some people alive who were at her last shows. Her hairdresser, whom I had lunch with yesterday, did her hair and helped put the children in the car for what was their last few moments with their mother. And Elaine Stevens' father, Gus Stevens, Absolutely. he owned the, uh, the, ni the, the nightclub. nightclub. Yeah, Elaine performed. Stevens was really my way in, and she's, she is, as far as I'm concerned, a local and national treasure. Yeah. You know, she I lost, love she, she lost the, the father of her unborn child. She lost her fiancé, who was driving Jane Mansfield's car. Um, and so my point of entry for this story really began through Elaine, because there's a lot of biography on Jane Mansfield, but honestly, she's a bygone movie star. There's no real relevance there unless there's a humanity. And I found that through Elaine's story because she was reunited with the daughter she had by Ronnie 30 years later. And also I wanted to express how the collateral damage of this event impacted the community because everybody knows, oh, a blonde movie star died, but they don't realize the man who drove that truck, it impacted his family for the rest of his life and, and now their life. Elaine's family, people who passed by that accident witnessed, helped get the kids to the hospital. It touched, on, in many cases, traumatized them. One blessing that came from that event was the Mansfield Bar, which is the informal nickname for what prevents cars from, from crashing so violently into the back of semi-trucks. And I've looked at those since I became aware of that. Yeah. I look at the back of the trucks and I see that bar welded down there and it's, it's there on, on every truck. Yeah, it stands on the shoulders of that tragedy. And, and really another reason I wanted to create this book, or this book wanted to be created through me, I like to say, because I kept saying, why are you writing this? And then I realized, this woman was a mother who has five children who didn't really know what she did. Uh, something she did that was unsung was tens of thousands of hours of charity work. She did charity work from 1955 when she first hit it big on Broadway through 67. She was at Keesler Air Force Base the day of her death. I interviewed a medic there who toured her around, a visual artist at, right here in Ocean Springs named Glenn Miller. And he said she was beatific, almost like an angel, bringing joy to these injured servicemen. And she touched their lives. And less than 12 hours later, her life was gone. So I, I've had the fortunate uh, opportunity to speak with a lot of people whose lives she touched and just gave a hopeful word to. It's been a real lesson for me that you can spend two minutes with someone and somehow alter the course of their story without even knowing it.
Now, for our viewers who want to keep track of what you're working yes. on and how, how do they follow your sure. your project here sure. to fruition here? Great, thank you. Um, well, my name is, as you know, Eric Lieberman, and I have a social media presence. I'm following in the footsteps of Jane Mansfield, were she alive today. I have Instagram, and I have Twitter, and I have Facebook, and I will be announcing the progress of the book. The book is pretty much finished. It's now being solidified which publishing house is going to release it. But um, I'm also interested in speaking with anyone in the area who's watching us now who has a story to share. I can't tell you how many people I've met who said, oh yeah, my father towed that truck after the accident. My father investigated that case. So how can they reach you? Well, my website, ericlieberman.org, has a contact form on it, and they can write me through that, and I will write them back. Okay. It will get to me, ericlieberman.org. Okay, good. Well, hopefully some of our viewers, maybe there might be something wonderful that will pop up. You know. Absolutely, and I'll be back in the area to do, uh, hopefully, some book signings when we come out and have Elaine speaking and, and others sharing those moments they had with Mansfield. It has been an absolute pleasure having you here. Me too. Thank you so much. Thank you very thank, much. And good luck with the rest of it and safe travels back home. All the best. Okay, thank you. We'll be right back after this.